From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Good evening, folks. This is Dr. Paul. Thank you very much and uh, for tuning to our channel today. This morning I want to talk a few minutes about uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder, there are some specific requirements to diagnose this. There is DSM-4 criteria, the diagnostic criteria. When the patients have excessive anxiety and worry and apprehensive expectation that lasts more than six months, then you say that patient has generalized anxiety disorder. And DSM-4 has actually criteria and you need to go through that criteria before you say that this patient has this particular problem. These patients will have difficulty to concentrate. They worry and they are anxious. They cannot control those anxious or uh, worrisome symptoms. And uh, patients should have at least a few of the six symptoms I'm going to tell you about. Okay. And uh, for children, only one symptom is required to diagnose them as generalized anxiety disorder. Let's go one by them. Number one is restlessness. Patients will have restlessness. Number two, they are easily fatigued. They complain of fatigueness. Number three, they will have difficulty concentrating. They say, my mind is going black. Number four, they, will, they are irritable. Number five, they will have muscle tensions. Number six, they will have sleep disturbances. You see, so number one, restlessness. Number two, easy fatigability. Number three, difficulty concentrating. And uh, number four, irritability. They are so irritable. Number five, they are having muscle tensions. And number six, they are having sleep disturbances. So they don't have uh, all of these symptoms, but if they have a uh, majority of them, you need to diagnose them as a generalized anxiety disorder. There are other anxious disorders which do not qualify as a generalized anxiety disorder. For example, if a patient has a fear of or anxiety about contamination, that is a obsessive compulsive disorder. If they have a uh, uh, away from parents, for example, that separation anxiety disorder. If they have uh, uh, anxiety about gaining weight, that is uh, anorexia nervosa. If they have multiple physical complaints and they worry about their health, that is uh, schizophrenia, sorry, somatoform disorder. And if they have that uh, anxiety, whether they have some serious illness, we call it hypo hypochondriasis. So you see, not every anxious symptom is generalized anxiety disorder. You need to go into the specifics, what exactly is causing the anxiety, what exactly the patient is worrying about. Same with the post-traumatic stress disorder. If the patient has been to a war or some traumatic incident and can complaining of anxiety, then you need to say they have post-traumatic stress disorder, not generalized anxiety disorder. So even substance abuse, sometimes uh, drugs, and uh, medication abuse, they can mimic like generalized anxiety disorder. Even medical disorders like hyperthyroidism, a patient with hyperthyroidism can look anxious, but that's a medical condition, not uh, a psychiatric uh, condition. So the differentiation is uh, very, very important. Generalized anxiety disorder, I will say GAD for the sake of brevity, it is uh, very common and it's more common in women and is uh, usually chronic. It runs a chronic course. And uh, it is uh, very common uh, to see these patients in general practice. And many times we think that generalized anxiety disorder patients will go to a psychiatrist. Not so. Most of them come to a primary care physician like myself. So the primary care physician should be very sensitive uh, to the emotional needs of the patients. Um, oh no, she can go. Patients with uh, GAD, they have uh, comorbidity, like uh, they may be having depression also. So 
you need to have that uh, sensitivity to the emotional needs of these patients. And let us go to some particulars, the genetics. And it is very common to see generalized anxiety disorder in families. There is a thing called familial aggregation. That means the parents suffering from anxiety, then their children will have more symptoms, then their grandchildren will have more symptoms. And uh, two studies have shown, actually, that uh, familial aggregation is present in generalized anxiety disorder. The persistent uh, worry and uh, coupled with the symptoms of hyperarousal are seen uh, in family members. So then it becomes a family phenomenon. So you need to explore, is anybody else having the same anxious symptoms like you? That should be the question in history when you ask about the family history. And uh, patients are usually, I mean, uh, they may not say, I'm anxious. Very few people say that, I'm anxious, doctor. Mm -hmm. And most often, they give you cues, like, I'm irritable, I can't sleep, and uh, uh, I am fatigued so easily. So those are the cues to explore further and to diagnose patients with uh, generalized anxiety disorder. And that's the job for the primary care physician because most of these patients come to primary care physicians rather than their psychiatrist. And uh, also the long-term care of these patients also falls for primary care uh, physicians, uh, physicians because so many times we don't even uh, find uh, an appointment with a psychiatrist. Now, there are scientific studies done like a magnetic resonance spectroscopy on these patients, and uh, uh, there is an association, there is an asymmetric increases in the concentration of uh, an aspartate creatinine ratio in the brains of these patients. I'm just uh, talking uh, about it as like an interesting point. There is nothing other, uh, other than that for that point. So there is a, an increased anaspartic state creatinine ratio in the brains of these patients when you do magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And the differential diagnosis is same. I enumerated many, many things. Physical conditions like hyperthyroidism can uh, present as GAD. Obsessive compulsive disorder can uh, present as uh, GAD, panic disorder, somatoform disorder, and uh, bipolar disorder can present as uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Eating disorders like anorexia nervosa can, can, can mimic like generalized anxiety disorder. And personality disorders like uh, hyperarousal and uh, also aggressive behavior can look like uh, generalized anxiety disorder. So a careful history will help you to differentiate between GAD and other common psychiatric problems. So you see, folks, there is a, a criteria, DSM-4 criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. There is a very important differential diagnosis because if you don't go into differential diagnosis, you can miss some of the serious things like hyperthyroidism uh, when these patients present to you. And now, let us talk a few minutes about uh, treatment. Treatment, as I said, depends on finding the underlying cause. What exactly is causing the anxiety? What is the focus of the anxiety? And uh, that determines everything. Is the patient anxious or worry about anything? I mean, as I said, if the patient is worrying about uh, being contaminated, that is obsessive compulsive disorder. The patient is worrying about being separated from a loved one, that is separation anxiety disorder. The patient is worrying about uh, getting, uh, uh, gaining more weight, that is uh, uh, anorexia nervosa. If the patient has multiple physical complaints, then that is somatoform disorder. If the patient is worrying about uh, uh, having a serious illness, that is hypochondriasis. If the patient uh, has been to you with anxiety and worry after a traumatic event, that is post-traumatic stress disorder. So in the treatment, you need to identify the cause. And uh, if those things are there, then it's not even generalized anxiety disorder. You say if the 
definition changes every time. And now when you come to the treatment, the pharmacotherapy is very important. And when there is severe anxiety, you can start with the benzodiazepines. And benzodiazepines, they relieve symptoms. But you see, GAD is a long-term problem. And uh, benzodiazepines are not curative. They are useful in uh, initial stages. And you see, the other important thing is benzodiazepines are abused so commonly by the people. And uh, benzodiazepines generally should not be used uh, uh, alone. You say you don't give these benzodiazepines by themselves. You, you use them as adjunct to treatment. If the patient has severe anxiety, you give them these benzodiazepines, and slowly you add them other anxiolytics, and slowly you wean them off benzodiazepines and keep them on the other medications. So, uh, benzodiazepines are good in the initial stages before you introduce them on other medications, or you send the patients to psychotherapy. And uh, patients should have uh, that reliability before you give them benzodiazepines. And uh, patients should be monitored closely as you give them benzodiazepines. Why? Because benzodiazepines are some of the most common abuser drugs in the market. There are millions of people who uh, deceive doctors and uh, take these medications and sell them on the streets. Like I uh, say, like Xanax is like four dollars in the street. Clonopin sells like five dollars. Ativan sells like uh, six to seven dollars in the market. So there are millions of people who uh, come to doctors feeling anxiety, take these uh, medications, sell them in the street and make money out of it. I mean, we blame politicians for the healthcare crisis, but we do not uh, even think about millions of pe people who are actually abusing and uh, causing this crisis. But that's a different problem uh, we don't have to go into. So benzodiazepines, they are good for the short-term treatment and uh, as an adjunct to treatment to in the uh, generalized anxiety. And uh, in general, you use them as uh, briefly and interruptedly. Like, for example, the patient, as you start them, you start them on benzodiazepines. And when they are good, you can wean them off. When they have a very traumatic or anxious event in their life and they are uh, seriously impaired in their daily activities, you can bring back, you can, bring, you can give them benzodiazepines again uh, as their symptoms get worse. So benzodiazepines can be used briefly and intermittently to give control over their symptoms. And uh, benzodiazepines, they come with their own side effects like daytime sedation and ataxia. And uh, so you need to think of uh, those things also when you give benzodiazepines uh, to these patients. Now, they can also cause uh, falls in the elderly. Like if you give Ativan to an elderly patient, it can cause a delirium or uh, uh, loss of balance and they can fall. So when you give benzodiazepines to elderly patients, you need to be careful. And they can also cause short-term memory problems and a profound memory loss. So you see folks, uh, when you give benzodiazepines, it's very important to think who you are giving them to. Like, uh, is it a real genuine patient who needs to be taken care of? Is it somebody who is feigning uh, anxiety to just uh, collect uh, some uh, Xanax as their uh, regular candy or it's uh, some uh, elderly patient. So those are the things you need to remember about uh, uh, benzodiazepines. Then there is uh, there are other medications. There are people who are using uh, Buspiron. Buspiron has uh, had, uh, many good effects. It has no motor or uh, memory or uh, concentration impairments and uh, it's also a partial agonist and uh, it, it, it does not also cause withdrawal or dependency. So you can also use Buspiron for the uh, treatment of uh, anxiety disorder. And then there is uh, psychotherapy. Psychotherapy helps to think about uh, what exactly is causing the symptoms and uh, what exactly 
uh, is happening in the patient's daily lifestyle. There is a cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, which actually sees the ang anxious, uh, what, what exactly is causing anxiety in the patient, and then to treat that anxiety. So we do that in psychotherapy, especially cognitive behavior therapy. So benzodiazepines, SSRIs, and the buspiron, and the psychotherapy, and all these things, they uh, help these patients. See, buspiron, it stimulates locus ceruleus in the brain, and it, uh, uh, it can uh, cause anxiety in some patients. So that's all saying for some patients will actually become anxious when you start them buspiron. So in these patients you need to think of other medications. So it all depends on uh, who, you are, who you are treating uh, folks. So let us uh, briefly recap. Buspiron, you can use it five times, uh, five milligrams tablets. And uh, there are uh, other drugs like uh, imipramine, like you can use 25 milligrams bedtime tablets, imipromine it can cause dry mouth, blood division, constipation, urinary hesitancy, orthostasis, somnolence, anxiety. And there is venlafaxine, 37.5 milligrams. You can use uh, venlafaxine. It can cause sexual dysfunction, withdrawal reaction. There are benzodiazepines. And uh, I told you so much. They can cause memory impairment and uh, uh, physical dependence, withdrawal reactions. And you can also use tricyclic antidepressants like uh, imipromine. Tricyclic antidepressants also help these patients. Venlafaxine. Venlafaxine is one of the most commonly used medications nowadays. Like uh, buspiron, the, the effects are delayed. All these medications' effects can be delayed. In that time frame, you use uh, benzodiazepines until they start kicking. So SSRIs are helpful, but they have not been used adequately. You can also use uh, beta blockers like propranolol. See, propranolol brings down all that to stimulate reactivity in the cardiovascular system, and it also helps anxiety. So anxiolytic medications, folks, they are diverse. And uh, sometimes you have to use them in conjunction with antidepressant medications. You see, many patients with anxiety will have uh, depression as a concomitant of morbidity. So you need to use antipsychotics in these patients along with uh, anxiolytics. Those are the most important uh, points and we can talk uh, all the day about this problem but I hope I gave you the most important points. If you come across uh, other important points, please feel free to post them on our blog. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you, and may God richly bless you.